from the beginning. Um, one of the things that I've, I've been hearing is that if I don't share the link on my YouTube, it's actually really hard to access because you still need the uh, password. So I'm going to try to do that correctly this time. So uh, before we get started, everybody doing okay? Anybody have any pressing questions? Okay. Um, I'm pretty excited about our lecture for next week. I've been working on it. Um, I did not anticipate that Gone with the Wind would like have a cultural moment right when I was trying to teach about it, but here we are. It's getting banned and people are pissed and it's very exciting. Um, so today we are going to talk about chapters 18 and 19 and they are, to be fair, a little repetitive. Uh, a lot of this is stuff that we had sort of begun to talk about, especially yesterday. So uh, the good news is if you're exhausted and your brain is full, this will be a little bit of a repeat of things you might already know, uh, which is good for you. Brains like it when you repeat information. That's a large part of how we learn. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen and we will observe my very beautiful slideshow. I've really been working on adding as many pictures as possible. All right. So, um, as a sort of a brief ref refresher, so far what we've talked about is like all of the stuff that led up to the revolution, um, especially this idea that we were just obsessed uh, with earning and with commerce and with social climbing. Um, and so it wasn't that like things were really terrible and so we wanted a revolution, which is normal, which is happening right now. Uh, it was more that things were really good, so they wanted to prevent a backslide, so they had a revolution. So. We are going to start um, with, in chapter 18, the celebration of commerce. And I really love this chapter because uh, I think it is so American. And this is something that we talked about a lot, actually, in Core 202. Uh, you guys might remember we talked about, like, um, Faber and the Protestant ethic. So this is sort of the beginning of that, this idea that Americans are just obsessed with money. Um, so let's get started. So one of the things that was kind of going on um, in America at this time was what we talked about yesterday, this idea of like conspicuous consumption, um, this idea that people, instead of working to survive, were working to make a surplus and then like show other people that they have that surplus. And so basically it caught on and Americans were just obsessed. Um, and this bottom quote here is from a letter um, that somebody who was visiting wrote back to England and I kind of love it. It says, from one end of the continent to the other, the universal war is commerce, commerce, at all events, commerce. Um, and I think that that's just so American, like that's just our jam. But it's really kind of interesting because this was not normal. Um, in most places you did business, but you didn't like talk about it, you know? And so the fact that Americans were just obsessed with getting more money and talking about business and buying things and trading things was actually very unusual. So this led to a beautiful American invention, which is the word businessman. So this word didn't even exist. Um, and to be fair, I might be super interested in this because my background is partially in sociolinguistics. And in sociolinguistics, one of the things that we talk about is this idea that sometimes we, ha we have to have a word first before we can have a concept. Um, and this was kind of an example of that. So we didn't even have the word businessman because we didn't have people who did business all day. Like if you were a really wealthy landowner, you might have a man of business and he was sort of like a secretary, like a manager of your estate. But people, especially wealthy men, didn't do business all day. Um, that would have been super tacky. It was, it was tacky to talk about money. It was tacky to be involved in business. Like remember last week we were talking about uh, vocation but not avocation. So like it was cool if you had a hobby. Like you could, you could raise um, hound dogs or something like that and sell them, but you weren't like making your living that way. That would have been very tanky. Uh, so Americans basically kind of reversed this script and they were like, no, you know what we love? Business. Let's talk about nothing but money. Uh, let's just sell and trade. Let's just do this all day. And everybody else who like visited, especially from the continent, was straight up horrified. So literally the invention of the word businessman uh, was like part of our American dream, this idea that there was a person who just did commerce all day. Um, and so it was kind of amazing that, that, that it took off so heavily. Um, and it, I think, I would argue it still does. So this 
became a giant cultural shift. Uh, people got really into buying and trading instead of like making things. And they got really into having money and having business instead of having land. So where previously we had been obsessed with land and everybody was like, you know what, I've got to get some land. That's how I become a person. Now people were like, oh, I need to get a business. That's how I become a person. So people started um, like going back into the, the trades, like in terms of like artisanal trades. Uh, and people started investing their money and they started opening banks and they started charging interest. And it was like a whole thing. So instead of the like previous gentleman farmer sort of movement, we were making this dramatic shift to like a city business name. Like we're all city mouse now. So predictably, um, every time something changes, everybody freaks out, right? So predictably, um, people were concerned that this was destroying our American values. Uh, they were basically worried that we had given up on this idea of the greater good, that we had given up on our enlightenment ideals, that we were like becoming um, like a lower sort of human. So basically everybody was talking about getting paid instead of talking about like doing the right thing. Um, and this is again, one of the, the poems that somebody wrote at the time. On others inspiration flash, give them eternal fame, but give me cash. I love it so much. Uh, if one of you is a graffiti artist, I would appreciate it if you would make a mural of this. I just think it's so American. Um, and it did remind me very strongly, of course, of the character from Parks and Rec. Um, so this was sort of the beginning of this giant transition and all the Americans are like, yeah, it's cool. Like your ideals are amazing and congratulation and whatever, but like money, please. So one of the things that we did in order to like sort of revitalize trade and like make a big pile of money for everybody was go to war again. War, again, very profitable, especially if you're on the winning side. Um, so the war of 1812 was like one of our sort of longer and more confusing wars and it's one of the ones that we don't even talk about in history class um except you've probably heard the tchaikovsky uh, song which i really love but basically we were fighting england and it was supposed to revive our patriotism and the sense that it was supposed to like revive our enlightenment ideals we were supposed to go back to this idea of like all men are created equal and america exists for the greater good and like let's all rise up and become you know patriotic humans and instead it kind of backfired so um this is again a letter from the time period war will purify the political atmosphere all public virtues will be refined and hallowed and we shall again behold at the head of affairs citizens who may rival the immortal men of 1776. uh so this is a regularly reoccurring thing. Every time we go to war, there's this sort of like surge of patriotism and everybody is like, oh yeah, America. And they buy a bunch of American flags and shit. And this was like kind of the first example of that. This was this idea of this like revival of patriotism. Everybody was like, I just suddenly remembered that I love America and you know, look at me, I'm so patriotic. Um, this also happens right before the 4th of July. You've probably seen all the flags in the stores. So the hope was that if we went to war in 1812 and we won, uh, that everybody would sort of like give up on commerce and they would give up on this constant buying and trading and they would go back into like civil engagement. They would go back into this like, like, you know, feed the hungry, clothe the poor, like better America sort of mindset. Um, nope. <laughs> um, Basically, it sort of backfired, and instead of becoming like really civically engaged, we just leaned into commerce, and everybody was like, oh, did you say war? May I sell you this blanket? You know, like, I have made you this tin, you know? So Americans got a little bit more obsessed instead with commercialism, and they started making more stuff, and they started uh, charging higher prices for it, which is also very American. To make something that the American army needs, but to inflate the price? true American patriotism. Uh, so it backfired hard. It, it revived patriotism a little bit because people were like, look at us, we're so strong and proud and good, but it didn't revive the like idealism. So commerce continued to just like charge head. Um, one thing that did happen was a sort of rise in benevolence. Um, so this is a, another example of one of the first times that Americans started acting kind of shady, but called it benevolent. This is our other jam, we love this. 
so basically after the revolution, um, the kin networks kind of failed because everybody was spreading out and moving to new places. We talked about this a little bit yesterday. Like we used to just exist in like vast networks of cousins. And as people spread out and like left their family behind, now we exist in vast networks of strangers. But that meant that there wasn't necessarily a lot of help for the people who needed help. Um, so instead we started making it commerce. We started opening um, like orphanages and hospitals and retirement homes. Um, like all of these things that the family used to take care of, now a private industry is taking care of. Um, so you may again be familiar with this. Uh, this is something that people are talking about again, this idea that like is private industry the thing that we need? Um, like can the can the free market solve it? Can the government solve it? Um, and so this is sort of coming into play at this point. Over here on the right, this is a picture um, of some ladies who had just established an orphanage uh, and some of their orphans. They, they seem okay. It's hard to tell. You hear a lot of horror stories. So basically, organizational support was like on the upswing. But um, some of this support was sort of uh, forceful. I love the phrase forceful benevolence. I just, I think it's so gorgeous because it's like, what does that even mean? And you know exactly what it means. It means like when somebody, you know, like if somebody came into your house and was like, now it is time for you to take a shower. Now it is time for you to eat vegetables. Now it is time for you to exercise. Now it is time for you to do your homework. On the one hand, they're not wrong. Like they're, they're telling you the right things. On the other hand, like you can't just tell people what to do. Um, and you certainly can't just tell people to get rid of their vices. We tried this over and over and over, but like this was one of the four, first times that we started trying to get people to get sober. Uh, there were a lot of ladies who were going around talking about temperance and how we shouldn't drink, and this historically has never worked. Um, you cannot have a bunch of angry women yelling uh, at people not to drink. We know that that doesn't uh, do anything. So essentially, instead of really helping the people, they were like forcing values upon them. So this is, again, sort of a lifelong problem. America does this all the time. We're always like going into other countries and being like, would you like some of this democracy? And even though they're like, no, we don't listen to them. Uh, you know, we go in there with our, our smallpox blankets and our, you know, regimes and take all their oil and, and leave them with better things. Um, so like essentially forcing somebody to get rid of their vices is not a thing that really works, but it is a thing that we try all the time. So this is sort of one of the beginnings of that. So we had people, um, you know, trying to force people to go to church. Uh, we had people trying to uh, talk about prohibition. We had people trying to talk about a revival of religion. And it also doesn't work, you know, to force religion on people, but that's never stopped anyone from trying. And there were also these places uh, like the savings banks that were in the book, which I thought were particularly interesting. And what they would do was essentially garnish your wages on your behalf. So if you've ever heard of, um, if somebody goes bankrupt or if they owe child support or something like that, um, basically the government will garnish your wages. And what that means is that instead of the company paying you, the government just jumps in the middle and takes the money directly from the company. So that's what these people did. They would just like go to the business and take the wages that person had earned and put them in the savings bank and not let the person have them. Or they would like dole out a little bit, sort of like an allowance. Um, and they thought they were helping. Like they really, you know, believed that they were doing the right thing. But the thing that is tricky about humans is um, you just can't like you you can't fix people with force um if it were possible it would have been done i've seen people try but this idea that you could just sort of like roll in there and be like here's how to be good uh just backfired and backfired and backfired so the social programs were helpful like we did need a place to put you know orphans and widows but the mm, moral benevolence was not really going that well so one of the things that was sort of beginning to rise up that was like aiding this moral uh, benevolence, this like forceful benevolence, was a resurgence of religion. So in the like revolution itself, um, there was basically no mention of religion. Um, the founding fathers were largely not religious. A lot of them were deist, um, and deists essentially believed that there is a God and that God set the universe in motion, but then they just like step back. So Diaz believe, often they talk about it like a watchmaker, like they made the watch and turned the watch on and then they were like, okay, bye. Um, so Diaz essentially believed that there's not like an active God present. 
So some of the founding fathers were deists, and some of the founding fathers were just a-religious. They didn't believe in anything at all. And that's why they didn't include any religion in the Constitution. Um, there's not supposed to be any religion um, anywhere within the American government. We all know how that turned out. Um, but it was a purposeful choice. They basically wanted freedom of religion, which meant you can be whatever religion you want, but the government won't tell you which religion to be. Um, and so they just left it out. Uh, and one of the best stories is about this woman who, who asked Alexander Hamilton, like, where's the religion? And he was like, uh, oh no, we forgot. My bad. I just, I love that sort of passive aggressive, like, uh, oh no. Um, so basically during the revolution, there wasn't really much of a focus on, on religion. But then, um, after the revolution and like leading up to the War of 1812 and in this, like, you know, this whole sort of like time period, religion had a massive resurgence. Um, people got super into it, but they were practicing a different sort of variety. Um, so essentially, religion had come back and we liked it when people were religious again. Um, we kind of go in waves with this. Sometimes we don't like it when someone is religious and sometimes we do like it when someone is religious. Right now we're in a phase where we prefer that our religious um, or that our, our political leaders be a little bit religious. Um, they don't have to like actually do it. Uh, like this is a great example I think of um, this is just a couple of weeks ago Trump standing outside of the church uh, that had been uh, burned and as you can see he's holding a bible and he did this as a sort of a reaching out method to his religious followers because he has a lot of evangelical followers. But it's a great example of sort of pretending because the bible is literally upside down and backwards. Um, so we want people to pretend to be religious but not too religious. So the religion that was sort of on the rise was also, in a sense, very American because it was very egalitarian. So not to get too deep into like uh, religious history, but essentially um, the, the Church of England evolved out of Catholicism. Um, and it's what the Church of England promised was a little bit more of a of flattened hierarchy. So Catholicism has a very defined hierarchy from like God to the Pope on down. But what the Church of England was promoting was a more like a um, congregation centered thing. It was like everybody can read the Bible. Um, everybody can like, you know, join the, the clergy. Like it doesn't just have to be this, this whole really distinct hierarchy. And this took an even more egalitarian form in America. So basically it was called the Second Great Awakening. Um, and they had a lot of these tent revivals, essentially. Um, and we'll see tent revivals come back. This, the Americans love a tent revival. Um, but this was kind of one of, the, one of the first times that we did this. And the thing that's important about this historically is that it was so egalitarian. Like you didn't, you didn't even have to have a religious background. You could just be a preacher. You could just wake up tomorrow and be like, good news, I'm a preacher now. Um, and you could practice like a whatever form of, of Christianity you wanted. So like we started to see all of these denominations rise up. So previously your options were essentially like Catholic or Church of England, but now we have all of these little sects, S-E-C-T-S. -E it sounds wrong every time I say it. Um, but basically like the, the Baptists, uh, the Methodists, uh, you know, the Disciples of Christ, they're still around. Um, all of these little denominations with very slightly different little tweaks on Christianity starting to rise up. And so this meant that you didn't have to have like traveling preachers anymore. Like they used to ride this whole giant circuit. Now, just whichever man, because it was always a man still, whichever man in your community was like, hey, listen, God talked to me and I'd like to tell you about it. He could. So everybody could be a church leader. Everybody could be a preacher. You didn't have to have a special education. You didn't have to have a special uh, certificate. Like you were just like, if you felt like you wanted to, you could just stand up and suddenly be the leader. So we do still see this some places. Uh, some churches are still really into this sort of like egalitarian model where it's just like whoever feels um, called can like stand up and talk. Some churches have given up on this egalitarian model and they're like, no, you really need to like be wearing the right outfit and have the right education. So this was a really big deal because one, it demonstrated the rest of our values in the sense that we really liked the idea that everybody was fundamentally equal. And two, it gave a great social um, event. So 
Americans who were living really far apart, especially on farms, didn't have a lot of excuses to get together. But now church and tent revivals provided us with a great excuse to get together. So it became a huge social event. So going to church was not just about religion. It was about seeing people that you never see any other time. It was about like scoping out possible future marriage partners. You know, it was about like forming relationships. So a lot of people would go to these tent revivals because, you know, sure, religion, but also business. It was a great place to meet people. It was a great place to start doing trade. So these, these awakenings, these tent revivals provided us with like another opportunity to kind of um, push our values, but also to engage in the business that was our favorite, favorite thing. So it was a big old religious moment. So it was happening and it was working, but people were still a little bit doubtful, um, especially people who weren't religious at all were like real concerned about the religious people, uh, which continues to be a theme. Um, so for the people who weren't engaged in the benevolent societies, which were largely society matrons, and for the people who weren't engaged in the religious movements, which were um, you know, largely a rural thing, we needed a new way to like come together. We needed a new way to tie society together. And we decided on commerce because it's like a great way to um, build a reputation. It's a great way to build like a, a community. So essentially, they just leaned in. And this is, again, just a huge part of the American story. And I know I feel like I'm kind of like repeating myself at this point, but we, we decided that one of the best ways to prove that you were a good person, one of the best ways to get a good reputation was to be involved in business. So we did. Uh, and we started to develop essentially the Protestant work ethic. We started to develop this idea that the best people are the ones who work the hardest. And you've probably heard this, um, even if you haven't been through Core 202 yet, you've probably heard this idea because we're seeing another sort of resurgence of this, this idea of uh, getting that bread, uh, hustle mode, being on that grind. Like I hear a lot of songs about this. Uh, I see a lot of people like hashtagging about this. Like this is a very American thing, this idea that like working hard is its own virtue. So previously, it had kind of been a virtue, like it was certainly admirable to be a person who worked hard, assuming that you were of the working class, like aristocrats weren't supposed to work at all, that was tacky. Um, but now we're getting this idea that the best people are the ones who work the hardest, and the accumulation of money indicates that you are a good person because it indicates that you worked hard. So we start to kind of get into this idea of um, commerce being the same thing as virtue. We start to really lean in on this idea that being like a businessman is the thing. So this is when the marketplace started to really like become a whole thing. And this is still true. Like if you think back, um, you probably perhaps in your childhood went to marketplaces in order to be social. Like it's a, it's a time honored American tradition to get dropped off at the mall. Um, and what were you doing there? I, I, I don't know, you know, buying, you know, $5 things from like, food court or like Claire's or like you know what I mean like like what do, what are we even doing at the mall when we're 13 and the answer is not commerce it's meeting other people but this was still like a huge part of our sort of social world so the rise of the marketplace became huge like most uh, cities are formed around a marketplace now and it was like our favorite thing so uh, this is how Wood described it all exchanges are acts of commerce and the whole of human life is occupied by a series of exchanges and reciprocal services I mean, it's kind of dark. It's kind of like, really, do I have no worth outside of my ability to buy and sell things? But on the other hand, um, especially in, in, our, in our modern service economy, this is it, man. This is what we do all day. Uh, we work in order to earn money, and then we buy things from other people who are working in order to earn money, and then they later buy things from other people who are working. And so, like, essentially all we do all day is buy and sell things. Um, we make relationships out of buying and selling things. And sometimes we find meaning out of buying and selling things. But commerce is one of our major social ties. So like, this is something I think to kind of roll around in your brain as you go through like your week. To be fair, I think time, times are different. Like we're not necessarily going to the same coffee shop every day uh, or building relationships with like the delivery man uh, who brings your pizza. Um, but it's, it's a really crucial part of sort of the American understanding is this idea that everybody has a job everybody earns and everybody buys. 
Um, other cultures are not so obsessed with this. Americans are obsessed with this. We do not like it when people don't have jobs. We think that's really weird. Um, so the, the sort of idea that commerce is like what we do is developing here. You know, I've said it over and over, but it'll stick in your brain now. So um, I also thought it was kind of interesting that we started to believe that you could trust a person who had a business reputation even more than you could trust somebody who just had a personal reputation. So this is sort of like the beginning of Yelp or something like that. Um, the idea was that if you are a merchant or a tradesman in some regard, your business reputation was the most important thing about you because that indicated how much people could trust you. Like, do you reliably sell a good quality product for a fair price or not? So this was kind of the beginning of that idea that like, reputations are earned and reputations are based on business previously your reputation had been based on honor it had a lot to do with like do you have good manners uh do you duel correctly but these days reputation is based on business like do you run a real solid business uh do you cheat your customers and that sort of thing so the reputation of the businessman became really important to us. Um, and I would argue it still is. Uh, I think we're very interested in like what company people work for, whether that's a reputable company. Um, before I buy almost anything, I look at like all the reviews. Before you hire somebody, you look at, you know, reviews from that company. Um, so this idea that your business reputation was sort of replacing your personal reputation became really central to our ideas of, of how to judge a newcomer. So, um, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, this idea of paper money, but I wanted to sort of reinforce it, especially because he talks about it a lot in chapter 18. And the idea here, again, is that you don't need to know the person. So with barter, you did need to know the person. Uh, with exchanging, you did need to know the person. But here, you, you, you can just like have a transaction and then leave, you know, forever. Like you don't, you don't have to form some sort of relationship. So paper money was really very freeing. So everybody was, interacting with strangers, uh, everybody was getting paid for their work and paper money, and people were not buying on credit anymore. So it used to be that you could go to the store and be like, wow, it's been a rough week. Um, can I have a bag of flour and I'll get you back next week? And the guy would be like, yeah, all right. Like, I know where you live. I know your entire family. I'm probably married to some of them. But these days, if you went into the store and you were like, can I have a bag of flour? They'd be like, no. Like, where's your cash? You know, and, and to be fair, that is kind of the way it still is. Um, but in a sense, it was kind of democratic because it didn't matter how wealthy you were or how, um, you know, established your family was. If you went into the store without cash, you can't have anything. So a poor guy's money is exactly the same as a rich guy's money. So in that sense, it is kind of democratic. It's like, oh, your ability to pay is based on nothing more than your ability to pay. And we don't care who you are. So... And a sense that was like, again, a really American thing, this idea that like, we are all equal because our money is all the same. Okay. So now we start to talk about the sort of um, rising up idea that we talked about a little bit yesterday. So one of the things that we talked about yesterday was this idea that the second generation of men was going to be even. So we talked about sort of like evening the playing field and this idea that the first generation were going to be tradesmen, but the second generation were going to be educated, um, you know, like upper class trades individuals. So this is where that sort of started to come in. And so William Finley, um, who we heard from yesterday too, I love William Finley, he said, in America, no man has a greater claim of special privilege for his $100,000 than I have for my $5. So... This is, I think, a really interesting idea. So William Finley is basically saying, like, you are not essentially better than me. You don't get more privileges than me because you have more money than me. And this is, was a very American ideal, this idea that everyone is equal under the law. You, you don't get uh, better treatment in jail. You don't get a better lawyer. You don't get a different kind of court case. If you have $5 or if you have $100,000, you're still American. Um, and again, this is something that I'm really hoping that we can get back to, because uh, this, this is patriotic. I, I love this shit. Um, you could argue that obviously it is no longer this way. Um, you know, wealth really buys a lot of privilege these days, which is something that we're examining right now. Um, so I'm interested to hear what you guys think about this. But for, for William Finley, he was basically arguing that this was the point of the American economy. Um, we're the same. We have the same education, and our money means the same thing. So that meant that we didn't look down on people for coming from nothing anymore. 
Um, so previously, people who rose up, uh, you know, through the ranks, who had been poor and now they're rich, we were like, eh, mushroom. But now it was like, you would write a whole book about how you were a self-made man. Uh, Benjamin Franklin literally did it. He wrote this whole book about how his family was poor, but now look at him, he's Benjamin Franklin. And that never would have happened in the decades prior to this. He would have had to have made up some sort of story about where he came from or sort of like fudge the details. Um, but now it's like, it's like a rising up was, was the whole thing. It was something to like really be proud of. It showed that you were a man of merit. Um, this is also one of my favorite memes. Uh, we commenced from below and now have duly arrived. I think I would like to get a poster of this. Um, but it's, it's very American. You probably heard these songs, right? Um, I think Drake's version was very famous, even though we all know that Drake did not start from the bottom. Um, but this, this whole thing that, that you could start from the bottom and now you're here was, was an invention of this time period. Uh, it, was, it was an American invention and the idea that you would tell everybody uh, was also very American because previously again you would try to hide that or you would like make up some backstory but now it was like what's up I was born poor now I have all this cash look at my house there used to be this show on MTV called Cribs back when MTV showed things and it was amazing it was just people giving you a tour of their house um, and it was exactly this it was there was this idea that like yes I used to be poor but see now how many cars I have and so this is a very American thing this idea of like being a self-made man I dig it so that means um, that our social classes change again. So you remember previously we had that hierarchy that we looked at the very first day where it was like the aristocratic hierarchy. And then we sort of separated it into like gentlemen and commoners. And then we sort of separated it into like everybody and slaves. And that's exactly where we are now. Um, there's a little bit of variation within the gentlemen but the rules for who can be a gentleman are just incredibly relaxed at this point. Um, you don't even have to have like good manners and a good education anymore. You just have to like have a little bit of an education and reasonable manners. Like any sort of average dude at this point is basically a gentleman. And so Americans became kind of obsessed with like demonstrating this. So everybody started wearing roughly the same clothes. Um, everybody started using roughly the same language. Our accents started to sort of develop in a way that mirrored each other. Like there's a lot of really interesting studies about like Elizabethan, um, accents especially and how they sort of developed in America, especially in Appalachia, because a bunch of people moved there and they never left. So they had accents that were way different from everybody around the message of the story, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but people were basically sort of leaning into this equality. Uh, people who started shaking hands, which was not a thing previously, like you would shake hands with somebody who was of your social class, but not somebody who wasn't. Uh, but now we're starting to do this. People are shaking hands, they're calling each other by their first name. Uh, you know, it was a whole like loosening of restrictions. Everybody was like kind of on the same page. Um, some people were not into this. Again, the founding fathers were like, but my money. Uh, but some people were super into this. Like a, a lot of, especially people who started from the bottom and were rising up were like, yeah, what's up? Like, this is me now. So this is one of my um, favorite quotes. This is from a, a French guy who came and visited America uh, in the very early 1800s. And he said, everything smells of the shop and you will in a few minutes conversation infallibly detect a man's profession. Hmm. Just love it. He's just so bitchy. Uh, and I'm very proud of that picture that I found. Um, <laughs> but I think, again, this is super American. Like if you go, well, you guys probably aren't there yet, but in, in five or 10 years, every time you go to a party, one of the first things that people will ask you is, oh, so what do you do? And what they're asking you is like, what's your profession? And it used to not be this way. It used to say, you know, perhaps, um, where are you from? Or like, you know, what's up with your family? And, and one of the really American things that we do is we immediately ask someone what they do for work uh, because that gives us a more complete picture of who they are. It gives us a picture of like their wealth and their status, uh, the things that they care about, the education they're likely to have, where they're likely to live. Like you can really generally tell a lot about somebody from their job. But again, this was new. And to like everyone else in the world, this was gross. Um, so Americans' obsession with commerce uh, became one of our, I would argue, like founding qualities. Like this is our whole deal. So um, everything making sense so far? You guys doing okay? Oh, I yeah. can like extend it, please. Excellent. All right. Well, then, let us duly commence. Um, so, our next chapter, and our last chapter from this book, Middle Class Order. 
Um, so in a sense, this is going to be a lot of repeat from the other stuff. So this is like a really good summation, I think. So this is sort of what the entire book ultimately was about. So Americans became obsessed with being part of the middle class. Um, and traditionally, we think of being part of the middle class as part of a bell curve. So this is a bell curve here at the bottom. I'm, sorry, I'm sure you've seen a million of them. And the idea with the bell curve is that there are the most people in the very middle, and then there are tapering amounts of people on either side. So if you were thinking about what social class people belong to and what economic class people belong to, the idea is that there are very few people at the bottom, there's a few more people you know, on the way up, there's a lot of people in the middle, and then there's very few people at the top. Um, this, if you ask people, is generally how people think wealth is distributed in America. Um, it isn't, of course, and I encourage you to look into it. But basically, this is what we sort of thought was going to happen. We thought we would have a giant middle class and then a little bit of everybody else. Um, so this is sort of not really what was happening at the time. So in England and the aristocracy, there's like a huge amount of people on the one side. And in America at this point, according to people who were visiting, it was a much flatter curve. Uh, there were just like way more people just sort of like spread out evenly in the middle. Um, so Charles Ingersoll, Ingersoll said, were it not for the slaves in the South, there would be one rank. And on the one hand, that's kind of cool. It's like, ah, America, look how even we are. On the other hand, like, damn it, America, like, stop doing slaves. Uh, so <laughs> again, we've been dealing with this shit from the beginning. I'm glad we're dealing with it again right now. So we had sort of evened ourselves out. And part of this uh, was due to the fact that there like, was money to be made. There was education to be had. Uh, there was trade to be had. Like It didn't matter anymore. If you started poor, you could still become rich. And so what Americans started doing was sort of making a point of being even with one another. Um, so again, they started doing the same with their clothing, where they all wore like roughly the same clothing. Um, then their manners and education started to really change. We started offering uh, free education for, for the little ones, and then we started building colleges. Uh, there weren't very many yet, but we started. And this was like dope for Americans. Everybody was like, yeah, I'll cry. Um, and again, every time somebody else came and visited, they were like, wow, this is very tacky, like why don't you just have the aristocracy like the rest of us? Um, but Americans were into it, like we wanted to be sainsies, like we wanted to believe that we were as good as our neighbors. Um, and, and I would argue again, this is something that has kind of continued. So post-revolution, we wanted to be equal humans. So some of the ways that we did that are, um, for one, we changed the way that we educated people. So historically, especially in England, which we are all basing ourselves on, um, we had had a very specific type of education, and it was like a very classic liberal arts education. You might be familiar with this. It's what you're receiving <laughs> in, in, a, in a lot of ways. Um, you guys are doing a lot more science, for instance, um, than, than these people did. But over here, I have um, a piece of art that I made that I'm sure you can tell that it's really beautiful. Uh, and this is, of course, Oglethorpe himself crying tears about the lack of the uh, classical education. But Oglethorpe is very old fashioned in that regard. It used to be that in a classical liberal arts education, you would learn like sort of a smattering of things. You would definitely learn Latin and a little bit of Greek, and you would use that to read the classics. Like everybody has always read Aristotle and will still do. Um, you would learn a little bit of like science and medicine and law and history uh, and politics and economics. Like you would sort of have a broad understanding, uh, but especially you would study history and antiquities. And so everybody did that for hundreds of years. We were super into that. Again, we're kind of doing that now. This is, this is what core is. Core is very much like the things that we think you need to know if you're gonna have a liberal arts education. Uh, but at this point in history, it kind of went out of fashion. Um, so there were a couple of schools that still did it, but for the most part, people were starting to want usable, um, like marketable skills, which again, is happening. So we go through cycles. So students wanted to learn really practical things. They wanted to learn, you know, accounting, uh, and they wanted to learn medicine, uh, and only medicine. You know, they wanted to learn how to be lawyers. They didn't want to learn a little bit of a lot of stuff. They wanted to, like, focus on something that they could use to go into a trade and make a bunch of money. So the sort of classical style of education fell out of fashion, and the rise of, like, trade schools um, came instead. So, again, we're doing this uh, all over again right now. Um, and I'm really hoping that, actually, as part of the, you know, COVID fallout, one of the things that we'll see is a rise in people going back to the trades, um, because 
my generation and your generation didn't go to trade school. Like we all went to college. We were told that we had to, and we're running out of electricians and plumbers, which I think is so interesting. They're all retiring. They're all boomers. Um, and also plumbers make so much more money than me. So do consider it. Um, but basically everybody was going to school, but they weren't doing this whole like useless, uh, you know, liberal arts education. They were doing a more focused, like practical education. Um, people were also changing their manners. And this is also something that I think really lasted and became American. Americans became famous for being direct. And this is actually something I'd be really interested to hear from and discussion from our international students because Americans are kind of famous for being uh, blunt and like coming straight to the point. In a lot of other cultures, it's considered polite to sort of dance around and to sort of like indicate and to be a little bit passive. And Americans are known for just like coming out and being like, well, like this is the truth, you know? And so this was one of the places that this began to happen. Americans began to speak clearly and concisely and to the point, uh, like we didn't like, you know, like fuck around with all the niceties. We were basically just like, hello, I'm here to do business. And it was a lasting change. So they started to sort of, um, not bother anymore with the polite lies. I would argue we still kind of do that, especially uh, women. It's part of our upbringing. Um, but Americans developed opinions and they stood up to their opinions. Uh, they would talk about politics, they would talk about money, they would talk about things that were difficult. Um, even the women were allowed to start developing opinions for a little while. Um, so it was, it was this rise, and again, it was very egalitarian, but also this rise in being super straightforward. Americans were just like, these are the things that I think. Uh, and again, we can talk about it, especially with people who grew up outside of uh, America or who do a lot of traveling outside of America. But I think that it's something that's kind of hilariously traditional, like America's just like this shit. Um, also, we started eating with our hands more for a minute. We've since gone back to knives and forks, but um, for a little while, um, Americans gave up on knives and forks because they were like too cumbersome and too fancy, and they just started eating with their hands again, and then we went back to knives and forks. Uh, these are <laughs> some of my other sort of favorite behaviors that the Americans did. So basically, the lower classes started to try to emulate the things that they saw the upper classes doing. So when they looked at them, they were like, oh, I see what they like. They like art and they like music and they raised their children to be, you know, polite. And so they started trying to participate. So they started um, commissioning portraits. And this portrait is a joke. I think it's uh, meant to be the Mona Lisa, but it made me laugh really hard. Um, they started getting pianos in their houses and forcing their children to learn how to play them. Um, everybody started reading newspapers. People were un unusually literate at the time. And so it became like an effort to sort of like scale up this idea that you were, you were consciously emulating behavior that you thought that really wealthy people did in an effort probably to prove that you two were very wealthy. So they just like really leaned in. It was like, everybody goes to college. Uh, everybody has like carpet now. Um, people are really dressing up. Like it was, it was this whole thing where people were trying to model the behavior that they thought would make their lives better. Um, and again, I, I want to talk about this for sure tomorrow because I would argue that we're still kind of doing this. Um, we almost exclusively watch television, for instance, about rich people. And I would argue that a lot of our conspicuous consumption is an attempt to sort of pretend that we are those people. Um, and a lot of forcing everybody to go to college, I think, is a similar sort of attempt to like emulate uh, you know, the behavior of the upper classes, even when we can't afford it, we take out so much loan money. So this is kind of an interesting thing. So basically, the lower classes are reaching up. They're trying to do everything the upper classes do. But the upper class is starting to sort of help. They're starting to sort of reach down, but not mainly. They're starting to fund public programs, for instance. Um, so this building is an example of like one of the original um, opera houses and museums like basically the people with a lot of money are starting to build places that the poor people can go to to become more cultured um and this is again still very common like you'll notice how most museums are named after the wealthy guy that donated it or like wings of museums typically are um libraries uh buildings at colleges are usually named after whoever don like donated the money so basically the the members of the upper class started to try to make knowledge more available so they built museums and they built um, opera houses and they had ballets and they would have these like um, journals that were sort of the beginning of academic journals where it was like peer reviewed, really critical. Um, and they started to sort of make things available in a way that previously they had not. Previously it had actually been kind of important to keep the poor people out. Uh, but now it was like, you know what, like if you would like to watch some ballet, 
come on in. So it was, again, like a, a big evening of society. Um, some people were reaching up and some people were reaching down and we were all sort of trying to be on one level. That's great. So um, I did want to point out though, uh, not the women. It's hard to teach American history uh, without being sad sometimes. Um, but there was a kind of an interesting change, what happened to the women. So instead of making a more egalitarian system for the women, where they could also get educated and also leave the house and also do all these things, they actually kind of backslid a little bit and they started treating the women with like reverence, but it was a very constrictive reverence. Um, so the women were believed now to have this like heightened sense of delicacy. So for, for the colonial women, they had to like really work hard and get there in the mud and like take care of things by themselves and like help build the house. Like the colonial women were pretty hardy. There wasn't uh, a lot of like frippery and corsets and that sort of thing. But these women had reached a point where they didn't have to like do hard work anymore. They didn't have to do physical labor. And so instead, they became like, like little, little pets. Um, and you've probably heard of this idea of the gilded cage. And the idea of the gilded cage is like, it's very nice in here. Um, you have a lot of pillows and like, look how pretty your house is. And you have all the newest clothes and you got people to do your hair, but also you can't leave. Um, you might think of this as like, um, like maybe perhaps like a, a buckhead housewife. Like, yeah, her, her McMansion is very large uh, and her white Escalade is very beautiful, but she doesn't have any options. Like she can't just like do what she wants to do. She's very much trapped in her little cage. She has to look a very specific way. She has to act a very specific way. Uh, her hair must be precisely the right shade of blonde or else, you know, she'll get divorced and replaced with a newer model. And this is kind of that same idea. Basically the women were considered, you know, gorgeous and delicate and beautiful, but they weren't considered like real people. They weren't supposed to have opinions. Uh, they, they weren't supposed to do business anymore. Like we had sort of transitioned from the women are our partners to the women are on a pedestal. So for women, it was kind of a mixed bag. Um, on the one hand, they were very valuable. Everybody loved their women. On the other hand, it was sort of like their job to civilize everybody else. So they had to act incredibly proper. They had to focus on manners all the time. And they were believed to have a sort of like civilizing effect on the savage men and children in their lives. Like there's like the angel of the home. It was supposed to be like, you go outside the house and everything is like, Arr. but then when you come home, everything is quiet. I have nice. a question. Uh, what, yes. Price. Okay, go ahead. Back in the day that we're talking about, were women the backbone of the family, the signs of civility because they were more religious? Or is that more of a modern day concept? The religious aspect was not necessarily there yet. Um, it didn't have much okay. to do with religion. It had more to do with, it was more cultural than religious. Okay. So on the one hand, like they, the women were considered quite valuable. On the other hand, they were considered quite like breakable uh, and delicate and they didn't have like power. So basically sort of it was nice, but also sort of it was sucked. Um, so the really surprising thing about all of this, about this like rise in commerce, about this equality, about this like sort of shifting ideas about like religion and things like that, was that everybody kind of got along. Like everybody was like this little capybara. I really love capybaras. Um, but everybody's kind of surprised. Like things were really changing rapidly. The population was doubling every 25 years, which is shocking. I mean, that would be like if, if every single one of you had two children, you know? So it was, it was a, a baffling thing. Um, we didn't have a huge government. Uh, we didn't have like a massive powerful religion the way that some other cultures do. We didn't have a hierarchy and yet, kind of chill. Everybody was like, uh, okay. It was, it was very individualistic. Um, and a lot of people thought that that wouldn't work. They thought that a society based on individual desire and individual like effort was not going to go anywhere. But instead, it was kind of chill. Everybody did their own thing. And then everybody else did their own thing. And then nobody bothered anybody. It was just like, you do you, I'm gonna do me, and here we go. So it was, it was a real surprise um, that America, especially in the early 1800s, was peaceful. Like nobody thought it would work. It was, it was the grand experiment. Uh, nobody thought it would work, and it kind of did. Everybody was Kathy Barnes. So again, this is, again, I know it gets a little bit like uh, repetitive, but this, this was 
became like one of our most important American values. We really liked the rise of the individual. Uh, we really liked a strong individual, an educated individual, a person who had like a strong moral background and a, and a strong set of beliefs. Like we were no longer thought of people as part of a larger kin network. We thought of people as one person. So part of this got a little bit dangerous uh, because people started believing themselves to be the expert on everything. You have likely seen examples of this lately. I don't know what your uh, social media feed looks like, but I'd like to hear about it tomorrow because I have seen a huge rise in this of people being like, you know, I didn't wear a mask and I didn't die. And it's like, that's not how science works. Um, but people, because the individual was so important, began to believe that their individual opinion was also so important. Um, so there was a little bit of a decline in like uh, science. Uh, like the truth became a little bit more fluid. There's, a little, there's the, like this kind of the first rise of, uh, uh, alternative facts. So this is when we start to see a lot of like quack medicine rise up. Uh, this is the beginning of like, um, like Coca-Cola for instance, which, uh, so part of the individualism did get a little bit dangerous. It involved people being like, I have made my own decision based on my personal experience and it must be universal. Uh, and again, you've probably seen this rising up, like a lot of people being like, well, the police have never shot me. And it's like, well, it's not how any of this works, you know? But this, this focus on individualism, again, became one of our core American values. This idea that you, you could be your own lawyer, which literally you could in, in court, uh, the idea that you could be your own doctor, which we see people practicing a lot lately, this idea of like uh, homeopathy, for instance. Um, everyone is an art critic. So we no longer believe that you need necessarily any qualifications. We just believe that you need to think it's true. And this was sort of like the first version of that, this idea that you would look at the world and be like, here's what I think. Um, and sometimes this is okay. Like being an art critic, for instance, that's fine. Like, like it, hate it, like, cool. But like uh, being your own doctor can, can take a dark turn. So part of the problem with this is that we didn't have like an overarching powerful government to tell us what to do because we were still so obsessed with like individual rights and states rights so this is kind of the the argument that was still kind of occurring the idea of the federalist versus the anti-federalist or the republicans because again republican meant something different then um so the federalists felt that truth was constant and it was universal and it could be discovered especially by people doing enough science like these were the people who believed that we should have like one like umpire government like, you know, sitting up on top of the hill, shining truth down on all of us. Whereas the Republicans, on the other hand, the anti-federalists, believed that truth had a more sort of fluid nature. Um, and that just because you believe something doesn't mean the other person has to believe it. And sometimes, again, this can be cool. Like sometimes, uh, you know, you can like a movie and somebody else can hate it and that's chill. But sometimes it can be bad. Like uh, just because you don't believe in vaccines doesn't mean they don't work, you know? So it's, it's, a tricky thing that we developed in America. We developed this idea that the individual is right. The customer is always right, right? This idea that uh, we don't need to necessarily listen to the expert because I'm my own person. So it's, it's tricky in that regard. It kind of goes uh, both directions in terms of whether it's helpful or not helpful. So the way that this sort of manifested in the political world was voting. Um, voting is a great example of like belief in your individualism. Voting is a great example of thinking like, you know what I know is everything and therefore I'm going to vote on what I believe and I'm going to be correct. So this became the sort of like the power of public opinion is how, is how they phrased it in the book, this idea that the truth was determined by public opinion. So like, how much money should we spend on going to war? There wasn't a, like, you know, a number. It was like, no, the truth will be determined by the public opinion. Or like, for instance, right now, like how much power should the police have? That truth will be determined by public opinion. So we sort of gave up on this idea that we should like ask the experts, uh, which again, sometimes goes poorly. And we leaned into this idea that we should just vote based on our feelings and that would determine reality. So it became, again, a, like a super American thing that, that your vote determined reality. And this is still true, by the way. Like, this is why it's so important that you vote, especially in local elections, because what you believe determines, uh, you know, what the people who are in office do, which does determine our reality. Like, if you, if you decide to vote differently, again, for instance, in terms of our, our current political uh, discourse, the, the role of the police will change. So how we determine what our world looks like has a lot to do with what we think and has a lot to do with how we vote. I'm just going to assume you're there nodding. I'm sure you're nodding. So 
on the one hand, um, this was kind of beautiful. This this led to to what we you know experience now. On the other hand, the founding fathers themselves were like uh, horrified. I love this painting of Benjamin Franklin because he I like the face that he's giving me. This is total like disbelief eyebrow. Kind of looks like The Rock or something. Uh, but but he and a lot of the other founding fathers were basically like, oh yeah, that's not what we meant. Um, what we meant was we should be free and equal and you should do what we told you to do. Um, so they were really surprised by this sort of like surge in democracy, the surge of individualism. They had said all men are equal, but they didn't mean all the men. So in, in an interesting way, it totally backfired on them. Like the things that they said that they wanted occurred and they were like, um, so a lot of them uh, died disappointed, which is very sad. But because of their efforts, um, they ended up building like the first really gigantic democratic nation. Uh, the first like big picture example of, of democratic representation of like, um, Actually, I think I meant to say representative democracy, it's kind of the same. Uh, so they had built this big picture and it, it worked in a way that they didn't anticipate. Um, this focus on individualism made people happy. This focus on business made people happy. This, this loosening of social norms made people happy. Um, this, this effort toward equality made people happy. So ultimately, they built a system that people were pleased with uh, and, and lasted. We're a young country, but ultimately, even though they meant um, you should let the six of us make all of your decisions, what they ended up with was a democratic, prosperous, industrious, diverse country. And it's, it's very much in line with the actual constitution that they wrote. They just were really surprised by how it turned out. So ultimately, America. <laughs> I just love this picture. Um, but ultimately, the, this this thing that emerged was very different than what they imagined. But it it really like set the pace uh, for a lot of what ended up happening for the rest of American history. Like it really sort of set our ideals in place about what we think America means and what we think it means to be a citizen, what we think it means to vote. So it was like all of these social things added up uh, to become essentially the America that we know today, even though they didn't mean for it to. So. I'm gonna stop sharing, even though I love that eagle so very much. All right, so I know that was like a little bit repetitive of the stuff that we talked about yesterday, but is that making more sense now that I can see your little faces? Yes, ma'am. Good, okay, okay. I think it's such an interesting time to be studying uh, the foundation of America. Like it's, it's, there's a lot of questions right now about our American principles. Um, and I think it's, it's a really beautiful time to be looking all the way back and then look at like what we meant to become. So, so wonderful. Okay, so tomorrow uh, we will have our discussion groups and we will go into like sort of more depth. It's so much easier in a small group. Uh, I think the smaller discussion groups are working nicely. Um, so we'll talk all about it and we'll talk about what we're gonna do next week, um, which is almost nothing. You get to have a really chill week next week. So if y'all are having a rough time, all you really have to do is watch one extra long movie next week and you'll, you'll be okay. I mean, you could start reading your book. It's always a nice thing. But uh, next week, it's just going to be film time. So um, any pressing questions before we head out for the evening? I mean, the day? Like, noon? Okay. Well, then I will see you guys tomorrow. Have a delightful rest of your Wednesday. Thank you.